Welcome to Path to Unified Governance. This is our story at Databricks from two of us at Databricks, all right? So we're gonna jump right in with a quick story. So, hi, I'm Romit. In this story, I'm the head of America Sales. And hi, my name is Bruce. And in this story, I'm the head of product for our data warehousing. Hey, Bruce, have you seen the latest now numbers? No. I... Have you checked that dashboard? You know, we had 10,000. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Dude, 10,000? It was 50,000 just yesterday. Oh. What happened? Are you looking at the same dashboard? I'm looking at my dashboard, the one with like the better numbers. Um, maybe not the real numbers. Dude, 50K is way better than 10K, man. Okay, I'll go with your numbers then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does this sound familiar to anyone? Two executives talking about their dashboards and, well, the numbers don't quite match up, right? So really quick, let's go through the quick intros. Hi, I'm Romit. My real name is Romit, actually. And I I'm the senior director here. I lead our uh, IT data team that includes engineering as well as uh, um, integration and analytics. And yeah, my name is actually Bruce Wong. Um, and, but my actual job is a senior director and I'm the head of data platform uh, for us. Um, and before Databricks, I was at a number of different companies, uh, but one of the things I like to say is uh, I have a propensity for red logoed <laughs> companies. If you ever look at my closet, I have way too many red t-shirts. All right, so let's, uh, now that you got, we've, you have to know a little bit about us, I'd like to get to know a little bit about you all, all right? So raise your hand if you've ever made a mistake in a SQL statement. <laughs> All right, honest crowd, we have humans in the audience. <laughs> humans make mistakes. All right, second question. How many of you have made a costly mistake because of a bug in your data? All right, there's all the data engineers in the room. <laughs> all right, last one, last one. How many of you may have made a mistake that has cost the company more than your annual compensation from bad data. <laughs> All right, there's management in the room. <laughs> All right, so you're in the right place, okay? Fear not, we've been there. We've lived through all of these stories. Roman and I have talked about this in prep for the talk. Every single company, we've lived through these stories. So this is our story at Databricks. So let's set some goals for the talk today. So first off, uh, first off, we're gonna talk a little bit of some of the foundational things that you can do very early on. Um, even when you don't need governance, there's some decisions you can make early on in your journeys that help line you up for governance later, okay? Uh, the second goal today is we're gonna talk about how to do this incrementally. So instead of taking two, three years to go from like nothing to fully governed, we're gonna talk about the incremental improvements that we made along our journey so that you can understand how to do this incrementally, okay? And then lastly, we're gonna give you a glimpse into the future of where we're headed based on this foundation and based on the governance that we're creating, okay? So let's dive in. This is how everything gets started. It starts with a scrappy startup, an internal project. Um, so whether you're internal or external, whether uh, this is a nice stage. Everybody knows everyone. It's a small team, right? You may or may not have customers. You may or probably don't have revenue. And you probably definitely don't have profit, okay? Uh, but this, this phase is about finding minimum viable product. This phase is about finding uh, that product market fit. All right, so it's a really fun time. There's a lot of iteration, a lot of innovation, okay? And, you know, with a little bit of luck, uh, you, you keep going and you succeed, right? And what follows that success is some growth, right? I like to call this phase the phase of more. And with that success comes, you hire more people. There's more people here. Those people write more code. That code generates more data. You have more of everything. And you definitely have more dreams and more hopes 
uh, than ever before, right? So this is your growth phase, right? Now, if you look at this, this is, gets a little bit more complicated, right? A little bit more complicated, a little bit more complex, right? But hey, you're successful, right? So with some more luck, with some more, uh, you know, innovation and more grit, you end up here with more growth, right? So you have even more people who write even more code and you have even more data and things become very, very challenging, right? And you might be here at this stage if you're reflecting and you're reminiscing about, oh, remember the good old days? Remember the good old days when like you could, you could know everyone or all the data used to fit on, a, on your laptop, right? So you reminisce about those times, right? And this is a lot more complicated, a lot more complex. But remember, it's because you're successful, okay? So, me and Roman have gone through those phases and we've kind of like given these labels and names for each of these phases. So you have your scrappy startup, your minimal governance. There's no governance needed there, right? Everyone's trusted. Then, you know, the things that you did kind of don't fit anymore, right? And you kind of hit this like adolescent stage of a company um, and you don't know as many people and things start scaling very, very quickly. Uh, you might know this stage is if you start hiring roles that are like head of such and such thing, and there's like a team of one, right? <laughs> so this is sort of that start of that adolescence phase. And then at the tail end of this is like the ultimate place where you have really well-governed, really well-designed systems. You know your team and your org really well, but you're, it's such a different stage because it's infeasible to understand or know about the entirety of the system more or less the entirety of the data, okay? But you have the governance and tools to make you highly productive in this environment. All right, so I plotted this to give you a sense of our path, right? And on the vertical axis is like uh, the daily active users for your lake house. And notice this is a logarithmic uh, axis, so it goes from tens, hundreds, and thousands. And then on the horizontal axis, uh, it, it goes from it plots out the, the amount of governance that you need, okay? So starting with minimal governance to you need more governance to ultimate governance. Now, I'd love to tell you that Databricks kind of was great and we took this like ideal journey to get there and we, we, we built everything just in time as we needed it. But the reality was is that our company grew faster than our governance did. And our company outpaced the governance, right? And so we, and before we had UC, we were in this place where we need to actually put in a lot more governance than we have today. But thanks to UC, we were able to catch up on that governance very, very, very quickly, okay? Um, so the talk today is really about our journey here. We're gonna talk about what if things looked like pre-UC. We're gonna talk about how we used UC to catch up to today. And then we're gonna talk about where we're going after that. And also I'm going to give you, I'm going to start with a couple tips to give you some foundational things to get you started. All right. So first, the scrappy startup, the early, the early part. Um, tip number one is start with the lake house day one. At this point in time, building a lake house is very, very easy. It's as easy as provisioning your like analytics RDS instance. Okay. And so you might as well actually get started with a lake house. Um, Databricks makes a great lake house. That's why you all are here. But I liken these two things, right? So like the swimming pool is like your RDS instance. It's got limited capacity, right? You can fit a whole bunch of swimmers in there, um, but it's not horizontally scalable. It's not vertically, it's not scalable at all, right? But it looks pretty and it, 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 you can swim in it, right? Um, whereas the lake house, is you get started there and like it will scale for a long, long time, right? You have decoupled storage and decoupled compute day one. So it's actually more cost effective even day one to do this, okay? And regardless of whether or not you use some of the governance features in Databricks, at least you're on the right platform to start that governance journey, okay? So I'm gonna give you some facts about our environment today before we dive in, okay? So uh, our central lake house 
is the largest Databricks workspace in existence. We have 125,000 tables. We have almost not, just shy of 9,000 users. We have 17,000 jobs, okay? And most importantly, all functions at Databricks actually leverage data and AI, okay? We're not talking just product and marketing and finance. We're actually talking about things like legal, things like HR. Uh, we're also talking about even our facilities group uses data and AI, right? You know, like everyone's returning to office now. We actually run through forecasting and analytics to actually understand our capacity needs, okay? Um, if you wanna learn more about this, Roman actually has another talk he's doing on Thursday, just about this topic um, to like how we en enable parts of the business with data and AI. So check it out. We'll have more information on that later. So very, very big lake house. So our first move. So before we had Unity Catalog, our, uh, our, our workspace kind of looked like this. You had a mix of prod tables, staging tables, and ad hoc tables. And you know there was no like catalog or boundaries. Like you know, the Unity Catalog introduced the notion of a catalog, right? Uh, before you see, the, you had table ACLs and people could you could use table ACLs, um, but the easiest thing to do was that people would just use things like naming, right? And so you'd end up with like names that are like, uh, you know, if you had a name that was like revenue insights, right? Everyone's gonna look at that, right? Um, and in order for people to kind of try to keep their data private, instead of going through the hassle of table ACLs, what we found was people would name things like ZZZ, this is a test table, don't look here, right? <laughs> you all know that you've seen those tables in your lake house, right? And so, you know, the very first thing we did was we actually created user spaces inside our lake house, okay? So I have a schema, Roman has a schema, and uh, you know, this is, this get, like, think of these as like your workspace or your laptop, right? And you get to use, do whatever you want uh, on your laptop. But your laptop doesn't work because you can't fit all the data on your laptop, right? And so we, get, we created this space in this catalog for users. So uh, the first thing, some of the governance rules, private by default, okay? You don't need to go set up your table locals or, or anything. It's just private to you. Second thing, we put a 30-day retention on those user spaces, right? Self clean, it cleans up by itself and, and so forth, okay? Uh, and lastly, it's auto-provisioned, okay? So as you join, if you join the company and we set up your user account, we also set up your user space as well, so it's there ready for you for any new employee, okay? So that was the first one. That was actually a pretty easy one um, to migrate folks over to this was pretty easy. We actually, we actually do use some heuristics uh, based on tables on like last right and how long they were sitting there. Um, and if you wanted to save those and have those persisted, you copied them into your user space, right? And at a certain date, we said anything that's of this heuristic, we're just gonna delete it out of the, the, the main workspace, okay? All right, our next move, because you don't just work alone, right? You work with teams. The next thing we did was we created a team catalog and an integration catalog, okay? And this kind of mirrors how people work. So the first thing, table catalog, team catalog, right? Again, private by default, okay? Uh, this also enables birthright access, right? So we understand who's on your team, right? And we have our, our, our directory systems. And we actually, when you join, you not only have access to your own personal, you also have access to your teams as well. Um, and I put a star here because like, this is like some future stuff we're working on. We have a little bit here, um, but we don't have, you know, we have a lot more aspirations here. Because we have this, this place inside the lake house that we know is protected just for your team, uh, we can integrate with your other team systems that might be outside of the lake house, okay? Um, so, with that, I wanna talk, take a little bit of a detour and talk about something upstream of the lake house entirely. So the quick detour is logging, okay? So we all write logs, right? And you've all heard the term garbage in, garbage out, right? And so this is, this is how we do things at Databricks. So we have a full logging library that 
helps us enable the developer productivity here, but we also have the governance rules to support this. So first off, all data must be structured, it must be labeled, and it must be classified. And classified with the standard data taxonomy of the company. We have one data taxonomy. We don't have, it's not bring your own taxonomy, it's not a team taxonomy, it's one taxonomy for everything, okay? Um, unlabeled data is considered uh, most sensitive and like usually it gets deleted in many cases or it gets dropped very early in our pipeline so then like, no one gets access to this, right? That helps incentivize people to go through their logging and actually label, uh, structure, label, and classify it correctly so that you can unlock, unlock this. Uh, the other, the other you know, change here is this actually allows us to have scalable compliance policies, okay? All right. How many people remember GDPR? All right, I feel your pain, <laughs> okay? That was uh, years of like trying to get into GDPR. How many people know what the AI regulations are gonna look like? Right. So the point is, the compliance, compliance is going to change over time. And by having our data you know, in this mode where we can make the assumption that everything is structured, everything is labeled, and everything is classified. This gives us the leverage and ability to future-proof us that when new regulation, when new compliance regimes come out, we actually have the ability to, in one place, to decide how that data gets processed and the rules that govern that data, right? We don't have to go through, you know, multi-year migrations to figure out compliance in this case. So, as I mentioned, each of your teams probably own services, they also own logging, and guess what? We have a place for that. That place goes into your, uh, goes this way. It goes into your team catalog, right? So you write your, your application code, you have your logging, and it lands right where you have access in the lake house, okay? And we have that information to route it. So our next move is the integration catalog because teams don't work in silos. Teams work with each other. And so we, we wanted to create a place that mirrored that, right? So again, private by default, okay? Our general guidance here is like, we, we actually have guidance that like only 50-ish people should have access to this. Anything beyond 50, you're really starting to look at more of a production type of table that has broader consumption. Um, this is targeted specifically for integration projects, okay? My team knows this really well. I have this saying with my team, projects have dates, right? And so the purpose of this catalog is that this actually cleans up after time. So you start it for a project, when you're done with the project, it should clean up after it, okay? So this is also part of our governance to like self clean and maintain a clean lake house as well, okay? So let's put all these things together. So you have your user catalog, you have your team catalog, right? Uh, we've made the ability to promote data between these things, right? And then you have your integration catalog as you work with other teams. And then of course, we have our main catalog. Now, here's the thing, notice, no data lives outside of a catalog, right? There's no like table that's like somewhere off in the corner of the lake house. Everything has a catalog in a place, okay? And you know, we work with our teams, we work with our partners, if there's some use case that they come up with that doesn't fit into this paradigm, then great, we will figure out the right catalog and right place for that, okay? That's what we do as platform engineers. All right, so one of the other things is a culture of data. And we, we talk about qualifying for broad consumption. So data quality scoring is like at the foremost of this, okay? And so the, the, the quality, you know, I almost would like to say that Data quality is data governance, right? Let me just repeat that. Data quality is data governance. So we have a fully automated framework that we use and we've built uh, that does data quality checks uh, on your behalf. You know, there's some minimum uh, quality checks. You can also extend that to add your checks as well. We also, uh, you know, a partnership between myself Romit and other groups at, at the company, we come, came up with company-wide standards for data, okay? Uh, this is not bring your own standards, hey, your team has different standards than, than each other. 
Um, that's for your team database. If you want to do that in your team database, like go for it, right? But if you actually publish to broad consumption, you need to adhere to the company-wide standards. And lastly, we also have the ceremonies around it. So we actually review all of these things. Uh, we measure and review them for operational excellence. Data should have an SLA. Data in your, uh, in your main catalog uh, is an API. So you should treat it that way. Like don't make breaking changes to something that thousands of people are using, okay? So this is sort of a separation of concerns that, that we think about, that my team thinks about a lot is as data platform uh, engineers, you know, we care a lot about, uh, you know, we care somewhat about the compute and storage. We care uh, a lot about the access management. We care a tremendous amount about data privacy, the version and quality, the discoverability, and we care the, we almost care the least about data, ironically, right? We care about having great data, but the actual data is something that we don't necessarily want to care about. Okay, uh, we actually use the term data unaware. So we build platforms that are unaware of the actual data and that we allow the data practitioners to use our platform, right? On the flip side, the data practitioner cares tremendously about the data and almost nothing about the storage. They, they, they just want storage to be there and work, right? Now, thanks to being on Databricks, um, Databricks handles a lot of the, the compute and storage needs on our behalf. And Unity Catalog gives us the building blocks that we need to actually care about access management correctly, right? And so we care about the actual thing, not, uh, not the plumbing and not the infrastructure parts, right? So it's great that we're, we're on Databricks. We can focus where we want to focus, and we can build these experience and focus on governance. Um, but thanks to this, we were actually able to catch up on our governance journey and do all of this within 10 months, okay? Uh, and remember, largest Databricks workspace in existence today, okay? So we got that migration and all the governance done in 10 months, okay? So with that, now you've, you've heard about from the data platform perspective, how we thought about it, how we thought about going up through these stacks. Now I'd like to invite up Romit, who's a data practitioner, and his group does a ton about data. He cares a lot about the actual data, and he can talk about data governance from his standpoint and his story. Thanks, Bruce. So now that you heard that as a practitioner, I really care about data, and that's because we need to build artifacts that run the company. So there's one key operation that we all do as data practitioners, which is we transform data, right? And the medallion architecture really sets the stage for do that. So for the folks who, who don't know, medallion architecture gives you a way of progressing your data through different stages that lets you improve quality as you go. So let's look at it stage by stage. So in the bronze layer is where you're getting the rawest form of data. This is usually brought in from different sources, brought in from a lot of enterprise systems. Once the data comes into bronze, you're bringing it into the silver, that's where you have cleansed it, you have confirmed it, you're really aligning it with some of the business entities. And finally, you bring it to gold, which is really ready for business consumptions. So these are your data marts, these are your things that run your reports, your potentially your AI ML experiences as well. So let's look through each of these layers with respect to from, uh, with respect to from governance. So on the bronze layer, as I said, it is where you get the rawest data, right? And as Bruce has been telling you, one of the principles we have is private by default, right? So you wanna make sure since it's raw, you don't want it to be used by a lot of business use cases, right? In our case, only the data engineers have access to, to bronze layer. Now, another thing is since a lot of these data are coming from your enterprise systems, the system has done a pretty good job to, to think about data ACLs, to think about access controls and all the other stuff, right? You don't want to bring data into your bronze and basically circumvent all the good work that's been done within that system. Another design principle we have is even though bronze is uh, private by default, it is the best place to get started. So that's where we work with our data platform team to really start tagging anything that is sensitive. And once you have that, you can really start using it for uh, when you start bringing into silver and, and gold layer, you can start thinking about data masking and other capabilities as well. And the last thing I would say is um, one another just thinking behind bronze is just be thoughtful. Bring the data that you really need, right? The smaller the footprint, the easier it is to govern, right? And it also helps you with lowering your TCL. So now that data is in bronze, it starts getting used for your silver and gold. As I said, silver is where you want to build 
struct tables that will be used several times, right? So these are your employee master tables, customer master tables, that's how we think about Silver, right? So it needs to get reused. So that's why we have a little slightly broader stance with respect to access in Silver. However, when you get into Gold, these are tables that will be used for a specific team, right? So it's, it's driving a, a certain use case for the business. So in this case, you could have tables that are for your employee, uh, employee performance, right? Or your company profitability. So by that, by that, you really want to make sure anything that comes into Gold, you have a really strong understanding of what the use cases are, so you can build the right access controls and governance around it. Now for all of this, for both Silver as well as Gold, we actually use Opal and Octav to do our provisioning. And then we actually work with a platform team and use all the capabilities on data quality to make sure all of these are scored. Let's talk about discoverability. And here, it, the, the, this is the key capability for any practitioner as you're progressing data from your bronze, silver, and gold. And then data lineage actually gives you a lot of out-of-the-box functionality with respect to what you need for governance. Audit trails, understanding what is sensitive, understanding your access controls, understanding how data flows from one end to another, right? So it really sets you up for compliance. Let's look at one use case which we had, which is dependency management. So raise your hand if you have ever deprecated fields in your lake house. Okay, so for the folks who don't, let me, let me set the stage out here. Pick any favorite enterprise system. Let's take Salesforce, right? So Salesforce team comes to you and says, hey, we're gonna deprecate a bunch of fields in Salesforce that are going through the entire lake house, and you need to go and inform the users, right? And then we'll make it even more difficult. You know, we will not only just deprecate fields, we'll actually rewrite the fields. So we'll use the same field, but you will change the definition of it. You know, some of these might be same, some of them become completely different. If you don't have lineage, that's a huge undertaking. And this is an actual use case. It's an actual scenario that happens at Databricks, right? Now, luckily, we have Unity Catalog, which gives you that lineage all the way from table, but all the way down to a column level, right? And so that helps a lot to help us understand how these fields are going, not only from sales for the source, all the way down into, into your gold. And we actually have a utility that lets you map for any given field. It spits out all the bronze, silver, as well as gold tables. And we had just had a hackathon where an actual engineer took that and also went extended to go beyond just the lake house and brought in metadata from Tableau. So now we have full end-to-end -end lineage. So what this does is it gets us really excited where you could have really disruptive changes coming from your source systems. And if you aren't using the right capabilities that UC provides you, right, you, may, you might have to do a lot of work. So we're excited to continue using this so that way we can get ahead of the disruptive changes without actually breaking anything. So let's do a quick recap on everything that we have learned. So we spoke about user spaces. These are your safe, recyclable private spaces, right? We spoke about teams setting up that catalog, and this becomes a productive space for your data engineers, for your analysts, for your data scientists, all to work together. Then you have your data taxonomy, which is your consistent encoding. And the earlier you start and the more consistent you are really helps you with any compliance regime that might, might follow. We spoke about how these catalogs sort of interact with each other, right? So that you can seamlessly progress your data from your test, to, from your dev to your test to eventually your production environment. We spoke about data quality, which is really helping you build that trust for broad consumption. We spoke about transformations and really using the medallion architecture and thinking through each layer so you can, you can govern, uh, govern each of these as you go. And then he spoke about discoverability, how you can use lineage to, to really fast track your governance. So now, this is where we are, right? This is all, this is the journey we have made so far. We have done all of this, we have made all these investments. So what's next, right? Congratulations, you are ready for the ultimate governance, right? So let's look at what that actually looks like. In our vision, in this, in this phase, governance is entirely transparent, right? But it is extremely personalized for you to drive maximum productivity. So let's go back into our personas, right? For, for, for me, it's a fantasy persona to be ahead of America sales. So Bruce and I, we asked the same question. What is company's, company's revenue versus gold? And if, if things are set up properly, you would get the same answer, right? Yes, we have done it, right? That's what you want to expect. However, let's change the question a little bit. What is my revenue versus gold? Right? What does that look like for a, for a person in sales team? And what does that look like for a person who heads the product team? Right? And if things are working fine, you would, you would get right answers, 
but different based on your personas. Let's unpack this a little bit more. So to get the right answer for this question, what is my revenue for gold? There are certain things the system has to know. One, it needs to know the user who is asking that question. It needs to know what team they're part of, what, what level are they, where this in the organization. They, they need to know what revenue actually means. So they need to know what the metrics are, what the definitions are. There might be different uh, you know, sources of throat that have the, the right numbers, but for different cuts. So it needs to know all of that. And it really needs to do the context in this case. So the goal for me as a head of sales is going to be different than goal for Bruce as a head of product. So really understanding these three things are important. So when we think about ultimate, these are some of the features we're thinking of that will be really capable. So the system knows the user. So this is really building those personas that are built understanding your table access, that are built understanding what the query patterns that your, that your uh, team is using. It understands what all your team actually really needs. It really understands where you sit in the organization. Right? And all of this is set up as soon as you join at both right. right? It knows the data. So this is all the hard work we have been doing right now to really set the stage with respect to building the single source of throat. So it understands what is HR data, understands product, finance, sales, whatever you have. Now it has this language, which is the taxonomy, to really understand what is sensitive and what the degree of sensitivity is. So all of that is, as I said, it's, if, if you set it up in the bronze layer, everything is set up, right? because that's where everything starts. And not only that, we have we are thinking of capability, how any new data that comes into that space, right, can inherit or can automatically be tagged and categorized. And finally, in the context, and this is all about policy enforcement. So really understanding what is automated, how can it be automated by default? And as soon as new policies come on, how can we easily onboard them? So if a new AI governance compliance comes up, using a tagging, we'll be able to roll it out across the entire company. Now again, this is what we think the future is with respect to governance. Right, where as a user, you really don't need to think about what access group you need to, need to be part of, what data you have access to, it just, everything just works. So let's just do a recap. So in the last 30 minutes or so, we, you spoke, we spoke about the foundation. The real takeaway out here is just use the lake house. It gives you everything to get started. We spoke about the incremental, incremental improvements you need to make with respect to data quality, with respect to how do you set up your catalogs, with respect to using lineage, data transformations, using medallion architecture. And finally, we gave you a glimpse of what the future looks like. So in closing, we hope this was helpful. And the last we all would say is, may your data be precise and complete. May your data lake be clean and fresh. May all your data be structured, labeled, and classified. May your metrics be up and to the right. <laughs> may all the LLMs hallucinate a little less. And may you graduate to ultimate data governance. Thank you all. Thank you. So really quick, if you enjoyed this talk, we have a couple other talks we're doing. I mentioned Romit's doing one on Thursday. Um, I'll be doing uh, one on our metric store and how we, do, we built it um, this uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, and if you have friends that you want to like uh, us to talk to, have them come to the repeat session of this on Wednesday as well. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.